of you have known this, you've been with us, but some may be visiting this evening, and we're working our way slowly uh, through the book of Revelation. Tonight we find ourselves in Revelation chapter 11. The measuring of the temple, two witnesses, uh, the seventh trumpet, lots of language that we need to go to the Lord for for help tonight. But I'm going to read our passage, so if you have your Bible, you can open up to Revelation 11. The words will also be on the screen, but let's turn our attention to the reading of God's Word. Then I was given a measuring rod like a staff, and I was told, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there. But do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out, for it is given over to the nations. And they will trample the holy city for 42 months. And I will grant authority to my my two witnesses. And they will prophesy for 1,260 days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone would harm them, fire pours from their mouth and consumes their foes. If anyone would harm them, this is how he is doomed to be killed. They have the power to shut the sky that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying. And they have power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they desire. And when they have finished their testimony, the beast that rises from the bottomless pit will make war on them and conquer them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the streets of the great city that symbolically is called Sodom and Egypt, where their Lord was crucified. For three and a half days, some from the peoples and tribes and language and nations will gaze at their dead bodies and refuse to let them be placed in a tomb. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and make merry and exchange presents, because these two prophets have been a torment to those who dwell on the earth. But after the three and a half days, a breath of life from God entered them, and they stood up on their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies watched them. And at that hour there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. Seven thousand people were killed in the earthquake, and the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe has passed. Behold, the third woe is soon to come. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who is and who was, for you have taken your great power and begun to reign. The nations rage, but your wrath came, and the time for the dread to be judged, and for rewarding your servants, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, both small and great, and for destroying the destroyers of the earth. Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and the ark of his covenant was seen within his temple. There were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and heavy hail. This is the word of the Lord. It's given for his church. It's given for our good. Pray with me this evening. Oh, Father, tonight we humble ourselves before your feet, for none shall perish there. And we trust that your word is profitable for maturing and correcting and reproof and making us into the people who look more like Christ. And so I pray that by your spirit tonight, that you might do just that in our lives. Wake us from our slumber. Encourage us when we feel that maybe you've turned a blind eye to our cause. We thank you that in the trial and tribulation of your church, there is great triumph promised through this book. Oh, Lord, help us to, to see this, to know this, and to live it out in the way that we live before you, we pray. In Christ's name, amen. Well, in one sense, it's clear what John is seeking to tell us through this vision in this chapter. There's a temple, there's two witnesses doing strange and great deeds before being killed and then being raised to life and exalted finally to heaven. In fact, the overall tone of this Revelation 11 is quite different than the surrounding passages that we've been reading. There's no terrifying horsemen here. 
There's no man-eating locusts, but there's a story of two individuals and their work and their fate. And, I, and maybe I should preface by saying, if you're here tonight and you think that maybe you might be among being these two witnesses, uh, we're going to have to have a talk with you afterwards. But we'll, we're going to unpack a little bit of what is, what is going on with this temple, with these witnesses, with this death and martyrdom and God's final vindication. And, and let me ask the question, what does this mean for us today? And the first thing I want us to learn or to take away from a passage like this is God's protection for his people. God's protection for his people. John is called, he's summoned to measure the temple immediately. And this should conjure up in our minds, this isn't the first place that we see this. In fact, John, so much of Revelation is actually steeped in the Old Testament. I think we've been finding that, haven't we? Back in Ezekiel 40 and Zechariah 2, there's similar imagery going on of measuring the temple with a rod. And so what John sees here is not the physical Jerusalem temple or even a a heavenly temple here. What I believe, and I'm going to try to underscore this in a second, is what John is seeing here as the temple is how the New Testament understands the followers of of Jesus living in the spirit who are following after God, who've now become the new temple of God. Let me, let me read a few scriptures that I think underscore this. There's at least 12 that I've identified. I'm going to read three of them of why we are to believe in the New Testament, that the people of God, his church, is the temple of God in which his spirit rests upon. 1 Corinthians 3.16. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you? Ephesians chapter 2.20 through 22. And in him, in Christ, you two are being built together as a church to become a dwelling place in which God lives by his spirit, this grand cathedral in which God rests his holy presence upon. 1 Peter 2, 5, the church is a spiritual temple made of living stones, being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Now this, listen here, this is a massively debated point in the history of the church age, some believing that this is a futuristic reference in which one day the temple in Jerusalem will be rebuilt and the gatherers, God's people, will come and worship at that temple after the rapture. This is not what John has in mind here. Someone will allude and say this is a historical fact in which John is pointing forward to the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. Well, there's certainly some helpful uh, imagery there to think that this is, this is what the, the people of God or the, uh, the Jewish people had experienced. But John here, I, I want to underscore this. I believe what John is talking about is the temple of God's people who are living in the midst of a hostile, persecuting world. We see this because as there is a protection, uh, this divine protection of God's presence in the temple, there's also a reference in which the outer courts are to be not measured, to be left vulnerable. There's a kind of a, a lack of safety outside of the temple that will continue on for 1260 days. And if I could make a brief editorial note about this, the pagan nations will trample it for three and a half years. Now, th- this is Uh, Again, a highly debated thing. We can go for coffee this week and talk a little bit more. It's sort of fun to talk about. But many commentators say that this three and a half years is half of the completion of seven. Okay, It it speaks of the the brokenness, of the fallenness of of, of a completion. But some historians say that this alludes to uh, the reign of Antiochus Epiphany in in, uh, 167 AD. If you're a history buff here, maybe you'd realize when he came into... Jerusalem, and he slaughtered a pig right in the temple, and it was kind of one of the most grotesque things that could have been done to the Jewish people, and this period of the sacking at that time lasted around three and a half years. Also, at 70 AD, when Jerusalem was sacked by the Romans, many want to identify again, saying that this happened for around three and a half years, this hostility and suffering of God's people. See, it's following within these 42 months, these 1260 days. And so there's this historical reference to it. But interestingly, if you look at Revelation chapter 12, verse 6, I'll read it briefly. I'll start at verse 5. But it talks about the, the, this mother who is fleeing into the wilderness to be prepared and nourished by God for these amount of days, 1260 days. 
It says she gave birth to a male child who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman, I don't believe is understood to be Mary, but actually the church here, fled into the wilderness where she is a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for 42 months, 1260 days. It's incomplete of seven, but it's also speaking about the hostility and the suffering that would happen from the time of Christ's ascension to the time of consummation when he would return. The time in which Christians, you and I, and Christians throughout the history of redemptive period would suffer and be subjected to uh, persecution and suffering, and so fleeing into the wilderness to be nourished by God. So John here is, as he's marking out this temple, he, he's marking out a community in a similar fashion to Revelation chapter 7, where God's people would ultimately and fully be uh, protected against any kind of spiritual harm. He's putting a seal upon his people. And I, I wonder if, I'm hoping you're seeing the paradigm here that there's a vulnerability, that there is a period of suffering in the church, but also there's a security, there's a safety, there's a seal upon God's people that ultimately will be secure in the Lord. So John is marking out this human temple as a way of signaling God's intention to honor and to bless his people with his presence in the midst of a fallen world. Here's the upshot. Here's the encouragement of speaking about God's protection for his people. True believers, those who are called by the Lord, no matter what the world does to them, to you, we dwell in a sanctuary where God himself has, has pledged to protect, to keep, to be present with his people. This is no small thing. When compromise enters into the church, when the church wanes in seasons of their allegiance to Christ, when there is so much suffering that maybe we don't experience here in Canada, but throughout the world, it's easy to think God has turned a blind eye to his church. I think there's a reminder here in this passage that God has a plan, that he's the head of his church, that there is a divine protection, that he has pledged, that he has promises, that he has promised, that he will ultimately and fully protect his church. Maybe think about this individually for yourself tonight and God's commitment to you for those who have come to him in faith and repentance. The world may shake around you. You may, like, you may feel like throwing in the towel at times. You may wonder, where is God? The truth of the matter is to, to hold fast to this gospel, to know that there is a God who ultimately holds you means that you can't ultimately be shaken by, by the fury and the terror and the sin of this world. This ought to encourage us. This ought to give us great hope today. So God's protection for his people. It speaks of the great identity of Christ's church but let me ask now, and this leads to our second point this evening, what is the task and the role of these people who are at the same time vulnerable but kept by God's presence? What is her role in all of this? What is the task of the church? One word, witness. In fact, all throughout the book of Revelation, the call of God's people is to what? It's to bear faithful witness to Jesus even though it may mean at times suffering and death and martyrdom. To be a faithful witness unto Christ, no matter what you endure in this life, to stay strong. In fact, the seven churches were consistently promised these rewards if they would remain steadfast, if they would conquer, if they would remain victorious by the grace of God. Do you remember any of them? They would receive a crown of life that they would eat from the tree of life, that they would receive a new name and more, that God himself would be amidst them, if they would stand fast and only not compromise in the midst of difficult times. And here we're introduced through, through verses 3 through 13, these two witnesses. Again, this is nobody in the room here. And I believe what we're, under, what we're to understand about these two witnesses in this chapter is actually a symbol for the whole church as a prophetic witness to this world. It's faithful death and it's vindication by God. There is a church that is called to proclaim the excellencies of Christ, the beauty of the gospel who has been saved out of darkness into light, and now we proclaim the name of Jesus prophetically as a church. This was the fulfillment of Joel chapter 2, if you remember in Acts, that sons and daughters, 
they prophesy that there's this great domestication of the Spirit of God that would fall upon the church, that would usher, every, there's different roles, of course, within the church. That some would be evangelists and pastors, uh, apostles during this period of time. But there is a calling where ordinary Christian people would speak the Word of God and proclaim the excellencies of Jesus into this world. To reflect the light of the gospel to an unbelieving world. Here's one of the interesting things, though, I think that is noted here as, a, as another editorial point that John gives. The church is to prophesy, to proclaim the gospel, to be a faithful witness in where the Lord has called us to be. But you notice that these witnesses here, that this prophetic utterance, that these people are, are marked and clothed in sackcloth. And I believe it's a sign of mourning for the wickedness of the world and an evil that it will bring upon itself. So a faithful, courageous proclamation, but also dressed in mourning. And I think recognizing, I mean, the the, the consensus of commentaries is recognizing our own sinful and wickedness that we have in our own lives. And so there's a kind of mourning in which nobody is perfect. But even as we look upon the world and the way in which we prophesy the beauty of Jesus, recognizing the hurt and the fallenness, the fracture, the way that things aren't, uh, the way that things are. And so I think what this means for you and I as we think about witness, and as we think about this prophetic witness in Revelation chapter 11, is that our witness is to be shaped by an incredible, a wonderful humility, because we've been saved by the grace of God, so we don't go into this world with a combative way, but mourning over the sin that we ourselves have been saved from, the sin that we see in this very world. Here's why I think it's important to say this. There's a growing temptation in the church today to play by the same tactics of the secular culture around us in terms of our convictions and our politics, the ways in which we seek to win our neighbors to ourselves. There's a tendency and a proclivity, maybe not for all of us in this room, to be defensive and to be combative. To be judgmental, and I want to say that this is just not the way of the cross. And we're going to see this more in how these prophetic witnesses bring forth the word of God in this world, the way in which the gospel is propagated into the darkness of this world. But let us repent for being combative and aggressive and defensive at times, instead of being marked with a kind of mourning for the world that we so desire that people are brought into this kingdom. The church must prophesy with her sackcloth clothes on. But what are we to make of these two witnesses tonight? I'd like to tell you that I had a nicely alliterated message of all Ps. It's just not going to happen that way tonight. We're going to continue on and work through some of these major themes. Why these two witnesses? Well, John has two great biblical stories in the backdrop of his mind. I'm not sure if you caught them as we read through some of this, this wonderful and amazing language that we're reading about. First is the story of Moses who stood up to Pharaoh and demonstrated God's uh, power by the plagues, which were echoed actually in the past few chapters. Moses stood before Pharaoh, let my people go so that they may worship God, and there was these incredible plagues that they were finally free from the clutches of Egypt. Second, there is a story of Elijah who stood up to Ahab, the paganizing king of Israel. He demonstrated God's power by successfully praying for a drought and then by calling down fire from heaven. Two stories in the Bible that are marked, obviously, with supernatural power, but are meant to bring our imagery to how these were great uh, prophets, but how the prophetic witness of the church is in the great tradition of Moses and Elijah. I think what, what he's alluding to here is that the proclamation of the gospel will be a powerful force that will go into the world that will subdue the evil tyranny of the human hearts in a way that is absolutely unparalleled. I don't believe we're going to see the same miracles that worked through Moses and Elijah in our own lives and through the church, but in an unparalleled way. As we see the darkness and the fracture and the evil tyranny of our world, that the, as the propagation of the gospel goes forth, not bound, that it will even subdue the greatest evils of this world. Maybe another way I could say it in a pithy manner is that the gospel will always comfort the afflicted, but at the very same time, it will afflict the comfortable and summon a great unwelcome because of its message. This is what he's saying here. This this message tormented its hearers in Revelation 11. And as the aroma of God's word, as the aroma of the gospel goes forth in our world, there will be many who will receive it with great humility and longing. God has called me to be 
his servant. He'll also be welcomed with great hostility and resistance and rejection. Nonetheless, it will go forth with unparalleled power. The gospel of Jesus has the power to bring low even the most pagan empires and bring them into subjection to Christ. We see this throughout our world and we see this through history. Not through force or military invasion, but through the weapons of repentance and sacrificial love and grace and truth. This powerful prophetic witness will go through the world, will go through you and I, will go through his church in the great tradition of even Moses and Elijah and even greater. But here's what's striking about this passage. Here's what's striking. The God-given and God-protected vocation to bear faithful witness to Christ does not mean that one would be spared from suffering, right? Or spared even from death. But actually, in light of that, in rather suffering and death itself, like those who are followers of Jesus, like his, own, uh, his very own life, will be the ultimate prophetic sign to this world which will be brought to glorify God. Here's what I'm trying to say here. The suffering and death and persecution of the church will be a prophetic sign to the gospel in his world. I I was thinking about the quote. I'm probably going to mess it up here, but the blood of martyrs is the seed of the church. Is that Was that Tertullian? You, You recognize in the first few hundred years of the church through great persecution was the time where Christianity grew the fastest. In places like China and northern Africa, where there's been the greatest persecution to the gospel, it seems like at the very same time, the greatest revivals have broken out. Now, I don't know if it's fair to say a one-to-one ratio here, but it's actually through the prophetic sign of persecution and suffering and death that actually Jesus' name is, is, uh, is lifted high in our world. I remember this quote by John Piper years ago that always stuck with me. And he says this. I think it ties in. That God is most glorified in us when we're most satisfied in him in the midst of our suffering, not prosperity. There's something about our existential experience of suffering and even death where God is so glorified through his saints that puts a proclamation of the gospel and his beauty to a lost and dying world. I think one of the reasons is it doesn't point to ourself and our own wisdom and sufficiency, but to him and to him alone. So here in our passage, we find there's a grand celebration over the death of the witness of the church, a seeming uh, laughter of the world that Christianity is being snuffed out, that it's being pushed to the fringes here, and there's a a rejoicing that is happening as, as these witnesses are brought into the streets, a joyous celebration that the lampstand has finally been snuffed out. I think this is how it can feel living as a Christian in our world today. It can feel as if Christians are losing ground. It can feel as if Christianity is becoming more, less and less of an influence in our world and our culture today. It can feel as if liberalism is winning out the day in our churches. It can feel as if another moral scandal has heaped uh, shame on the witness of the church In some places, it's incredibly discouraging to think of the many Christians who are dying even today for the very witness and their allegiance to Jesus Christ. Things can feel grim. We can feel dragged out in the streets and the world rejoicing and celebrating to the death of the church. Have you ever thought that way? Maybe it's sounding a little bit emphatic to talk this way, but it it certainly can feel discouraging. But there's hope in this story. There's hope that God would protect his people, and it's, the, it's, it's never the end of the story for a God who is sovereign. In fact, let me say this, that it's throughout history that God's light shines the, that shines the brightest, often in the most dark places. Again, think about the persecution of the early church and how it overthrew almost most of pagan Rome in the course of a hundred years. Think about the Protestant Reformation, where the, the motto of the Reformation, in one sense, was after darkness light. The church had become corrupt, and yet God sovereignly would preserve a remnant for himself. Now think about the cross. When all the evils of the world believe that they finally defeated Christ, even 1 Corinthians 2.8, let me read it. None of the rulers of this age understood this. The wisdom of God in all of his wisdom and power and majesty 
to send his son into the world to die for the sins of humanity. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Here's the point of seeing the trials and tribulations of the church and yet the vindication in God's utter wisdom. When the darkness of this world gloats that the church has finally met her defeat, God orchestrates it only to further his kingdom, to expand his church and to glorify his name. The disciples on the day of the cross, it was the worst day of their lives and little did they know that God was working in camouflage, that God was working in a kind of way that would be the most glorious day in human history that would have cosmic repercussions for the salvation and deliverance of this world. We see this throughout history. We can see many dark, grim realities of gloating over the death of the prophetic witness of the church, and yet God has orchestrated a plan that God's ways will win out at the end of the day, that God will remain sovereign. So take heart today. Take heart in the smallness of your own lives. Maybe you feel discouraged. How is the Lord working in my own little life, in my family, in my corner of Edmonton? Take heart. God is writing a story of triumph and glory that through the most painful and dark circumstances of our lives, he remains sovereign and is working in and through that. This is what we believe as Christians. So we have God protecting his church, his divine protection over the church. We see the prophetic witness of the church that propagates, often not through prosperity and through power and military force, but often through the dying, suffering, and martyrdom of the church where where, where Christianity grows. Lastly, we come to the blowing of the seventh trumpet. We read in popular words, if you've seen Handel's Messiah before or listened to it, That the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. It's beautiful language. It's speaking that God has established his kingdom through his son, Jesus Christ, that will reign forever. This This kingdom will continue to grow even amidst grim and dark realities. It is not shrinking. His kingdom is growing. The kingdom came in the person of Jesus and continues to grow through our world through a suffering church as it continues to face the blows of defeat. And so we see this triumphant song from the elders who begin to simply worship God. I'm not sure if you found yourself in this praise chorus, even as we were reading it. Wonderful language, the God who was and who is and is to come. And they exuded this praise and worship to God. Let me read it one more time. They said, we give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. The nations were angry and your wrath has come. The time has come for judging the dead and for rewarding your servants, the prophets and your people who revere your name, both great and small, and for destroying those who destroy the earth. Through the awful turmoil of this world, God is establishing a people who will follow the Lamb, who will bear witness to his kingdom through suffering, which will be brought forth through repentance repentance and faith. The kingdom of God has come in Jesus Christ, but it will come still more. It is a growing kingdom. The God of scriptures is confronting the greatest evils of this world through his kingdom. And so when Jesus taught us to pray, Lord, let your kingdom come, what we are praying is not an escapist reality of saying, Lord, take me away from this earth, I can endure it no longer. We are praying that the kingdom of God would flow to the pain and fracture and injustice and evil of this world, that his his kingdom would continue to grow through the conquering, sacrificial love of his church. This is what we're called to be part of. This is what we're called to pray for. This is the reality in which we're welcomed to be part of. Let me conclude with this. The very last part in verse 19, it says, And God's kingdom in heaven was opened, and the ark of his covenant was seen within his temple. There are flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and earthquake, and heavy hail. A lot of this language that we've seen before of something magnificent that God is doing in the earth, something changing. But I think it speaks about how God is true to his promise. It speaks of the Ten Commandments here. And I think why it's being alluded to here in the book of Revelation is that God's covenant faithfulness is being made true uh, in bringing forth his promises through redemptive history. What God has promised and said 
is coming forth through all time. What he has said he would do, he will continue to do, and he will finish it at the end of history. His power and his glory, his kingdom will continue to reign. So take heart today. God has not forgotten his church. Let's pray. Lord, help us to live in this tension of safety and yet vulnerability. This kingdom that has come and yet will still come. Help us to be the kind of church that is a faithful prophetic witness in the earth that speaks about the glories of Jesus Christ. Even as we mourn over the the great evils and tyranny and darkness in our world today, make us faithful stewards in both word and deed to see the name of Jesus Christ lifted high in our homes, in our city, in this world, that your kingdom would continue to grow through a feeble people, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, if you're able, why don't we rise and sing?